Welcome to the Harvard Business School video series. In this program, Professor Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School introduces industry analysis and discusses how to position a company within its industry and how to create an effective strategic planning process. A leading authority on strategy, Porter is the author of Competitive Strategy, Competitive Advantage, and Competition in Global Industries. For suggestions on how best to use this video cassette and accompanying material, please refer to the viewer's guide and the user's manual in your video package. I'm Michael Porter, and this is my Harvard Business School classroom where I teach about competitive strategy. Some of you may be very familiar with my ideas on strategy, and others of you may be just learning about the subject. It's a complicated subject. Here at Harvard, I spend about 50 sessions covering strategy with my MBA students. And clearly, we're not going to be able, in a short program like this, to cover everything in this subject. But we've got on our side a very powerful tool, and that's the power of the video medium. Through this medium, I hope I'm going to be able to give you some of the essential concepts of developing strategy, but more importantly, to take you behind the scenes in a series of industries and important American companies to bring the concepts of strategy to life. And in the course of talking to the executives involved and, and seeing strategy in action, uh, we can learn some lessons about strategy that are hard to learn uh, any other way. What is competitive strategy? Competitive strategy is the positioning of a company in its competitive environment. Now, positioning means more than just uh, product positioning or the marketing concept. It's the total positioning of the company involving all the functions, production, distribution, logistics, service. The total picture of the enterprise is placing to the competitive environment. Now, how do we go about developing a strategy? Well, in developing a strategy, there are two fundamental questions that we've got to address. The first is the structure or attractiveness of the industry or industries in which we're competing. Some industries are a lot more profitable than others, year in and year out. And we simply must understand why. Because one of the essential parts of developing a strategy is to know how good the game is in which you're trying to compete. The second essential question in strategy is a company's position within its industry. Again, if we look at many industries, we see that no matter whether the industry profits are high or low, companies in the same business have widely different levels of profitability. Some, year in and year out, make a lot more money than others. And any strategist must understand what it takes to be a superior performer in the industry and not be one of the ones that's below average. Both of these questions are vital in developing strategy. Now let's turn to the first question, industry analysis. In any industry, no matter what it produces, whether it's a product or service or of any type, there are five basic forces of competition at work that are illustrated on this chart. The force in the middle is the one we most commonly think about, the rivalry among the existing competitors, the jockeying for position, price cuts, new product introductions, new capacity, that sort of thing. In some industries, rivalry is very gentlemanly and, and genteel. Uh, in other industries, rivalry is cutthroat. Somebody's always attacking the other guy. And as we'll see later, this is not an accident. Now, this diagram, however, suggests that industry competition is broader than just the rivalry among the existing competitors. There's the threat of new entry, the threat that new competitors can come into the game. And they bring in new capacity. And if entry is easy, if it's easy for new players to come into the industry, that's going to erode the fundamental attractiveness of the industry. So one crucial dimension of industry structure is the barriers to entry. Industries also compete with substitute products or services. These are other products or services that can do the same thing as the industry's product. So for example, if you're selling steel, you're worried about plastics and other materials because they're substitutes for what your industry produces. If an industry faces close substitutes, this places a cap or a constraint on prices in the industry. You can only raise your prices so much or you'll start to erode the volume as the buyer deserts you to the substitute. 
You're always buying from suppliers in any industry. You're buying inputs like labor, materials, and machinery. To the extent that suppliers have bargaining power, they can constrain the profitability of an industry because they can, by bidding up their own prices, uh, force the industry to absorb costs that it can't pass on in turn to its own buyers. They can strip the profitability of an industry. And finally, of course, every industry sells to buyers. And those buyers may or may not have bargaining power. If they have bargaining power and if they're price sensitive, they may bargain away uh, the profitability of the industry by demanding lower prices, by expecting more service that they don't pay for, and so on. So what we see is that in any business, the fundamental long-term profit potential is a function of the strength of these five competitive forces. The mix of forces will depend on the industry. Every industry is unique. But the overall strength of the five forces is going to determine whether an industry is a profitable one in the long term or one that's mediocre. Now, what determines the strength of each of the competitive forces, whether it be rivalry or buyer power or supplier power or whatever? Each of the competitive forces is shaped by a number of underlying structural determinants. In the case of rivalry, it's things like how fast the industry is growing, how high are the fixed costs, how much can you differentiate yourself from your rivals? These underlying determinants of each force are described in detail in your user's guide. They represent the raw material that you use to conduct industry analysis. To bring these ideas to life, let's take a look at a number of specific industries and see if we can't use this framework to assess their fundamental potential and how it might be changing. The pharmaceutical industry is an $80 billion industry worldwide. And it's one of the most profitable industries of any industry in the economy of any country. The average after-tax return on equity in the pharmaceutical industry has been around 20% for the long, as long as anybody can remember. And very few companies have ever have a bad year. Now, why is the pharmaceutical industry such a profitable business? Why is this such a terrific game to be in? Well, to answer that question, let's go back to our five competitive forces. Let's start with a buyer. There are three different buyers of drugs, but neither the doctor who chooses the drug, the patient who wants to feel better, or the insurance plan that pays most of the cost are price sensitive. Now, let's turn from the buyer to the barriers to entry into the industry. How hard is it to get into the pharmaceutical industry? Well, the answer is it's darn hard for two important reasons. The first is that in order to get your drug accepted by the doctor, you've got to have a thousands of salespeople. They're called detail men in this industry. And they call on the doctor and tell that doctor about new drugs and try to persuade the doctor to try the drug out on his or her patients. And it's very, very expensive to set up one of these organizations. And the doctor is very busy. In addition to a sales force, you need to actually come up with a new drug. You need something uh, innovative to sell to that doctor. And the average cost of developing a new drug today is about $100 million. $100 million just to get into the game. And about $60 million of that is the cost of testing the drug to get it approved by the government. And that takes years. In fact, there's not been a significant new entrant into the pharmaceutical industry since the 1950s when Syntex entered on the back of their uh, breakthrough and contraceptive uh, pills. Suppliers have little power in this industry. The cost of purchase ingredients used in making a drug is a small percentage of total cost. Most ingredients are commodities where suppliers have little room to raise prices. There are also few substitutes. Once an effective drug is on the market, it takes years for another therapy to make headway against it. Now, how about the process of competitive rivalry in the drug industry? Well, the process is pretty gentlemanly in this industry. Drug companies don't compete on price. They don't compete on price because they don't have to. The buyer isn't price sensitive. They are able to hold up the prices and compete instead on things like their brand reputation, uh, the quality of their sales force, things that don't erode the profitability of the industry. So the pharmaceutical industry is what you might call a five-star industry. Every one of the five competitive forces is favorable. Let's turn to another industry, the airline industry, with a very different level of performance. 
For much of the post-World War II period, the airline industry has been regulated, both in the United States and in many foreign countries. And this industry illustrates very well how government can fundamentally affect the structure of an industry. Now, how do we think about the role of government in industry competition? It's tempting to view government as the sixth force. Uh, to add to the other five. But from our experience, that's not the best way to look at it. The best way to look at it is to see how government is affecting the other five. And by affecting each of the other five forces, government can either be a positive or a negative for industry competition. Now let's look at airlines. Under regulation, government suspended the structure of the airline industry. Prices were fixed, offsetting any power of the customer. Airlines were not allowed to enter new routes, uh, nullifying rivalry. And new airlines were not really allowed into the industry, in effect, uh, making the barriers to entry unbelievably high. Under regulation, the airline industry's profitability was reasonably good. But deregulation unleashed the fundamental structure of the airline industry and has set in motion a set of forces that have led to very mediocre returns uh, since, since deregulation took place. Now, barriers to entry are very low. All you need is a few planes and you can enter two or three cities and you've got yourself an airline. And in fact, dozens of airlines have entered the industry as soon as it was allowed by government. The buyer is pretty price sensitive and is not very loyal. Uh, how long will you wait for uh, the airline of choice? 15 minutes? 20 minutes? Customers are willing to switch from one airline to another based on who's convenient, who has the best price. Rivalry is intense. You have lots and lots of competitors with different cost structures with very high fixed cost. Once you've got an airline fueled and you're going to make the trip anyway, you will cut price to get those incremental passengers. And suppliers to the airline industry have some clout too in, in, in aircraft and some other key inputs to the industry. So once government gets out of the air, airline industry structure, the underlying structure goes to work and that structure is not very favorable and the profits reflect that. Now we've seen how to analyze an industry by looking at the five forces. And we've seen how some industries are fundamentally more attractive than others, and profitability reflects that. But industries are not static. Industry structure can change. It can change either for better or for worse, for two basic reasons. First, environmental forces, like new technology, can shift the structure of the industry. And companies, through their own strategies, also have the power to shape industry structure. How do we analyze industry structural change? Well, once again, we use the five forces. An industry trend or a competitor development is significant for future industry structure if it affects one or more of the five forces. Now, to understand how this works, let's go back to the pharmaceutical industry, that gold mine I talked about earlier. In the pharmaceutical industry, there are three important changes that threaten to undermine that tremendous profitability of the industry. The first has to do with the buyer. Remember that buyer who didn't care about price? Well, that's starting to change. There's increasing pressure on cost control. It's coming from the government. It's coming from the insurance companies. It's coming because the cost of drugs has increased twice as fast as the consumer price index in the 1980s. Now, this increasing pressure for cost control is leading to the second important change in the industry, and that's the emergence of so-called generic drugs, uh, one of these babies. A generic drug doesn't have the brand name of the manufacturer, but has the identical chemical composition. It's therapeutically equivalent. And once a drug goes off of patent, as many have, uh, it's legally possible for the drug to be imitated by another manufacturer. Now, increasingly, the government is legislating that doctors have to prescribe a generic, not the brand name of the manufacturer. The third important change in the pharmaceutical industry is the emergence of biotechnology. Now, biotechnology is a whole new way of doing research on drugs. But let's think about the impact of biotechnology on the structure of the pharmaceutical industry. It's doing a couple of things. First of all, it's reducing the cost of developing new drugs, lowering the barriers to entry. 
And in the process, whole new companies like Genentech with entirely new skills have an opportunity to enter this industry for the first time in decades. Now, these three changes, cost containment, generic drugs, and biotechnology are all undermining the structure of the pharmaceutical industry. And unless drug companies can react or respond, the average profitability of that industry is likely to go down. But it doesn't always work that way. In some industries, structural change is positive. Now, let's return to the airline industry and discuss three important changes that are occurring in that industry that have the promise to fundamentally improve the industry that's been so difficult and so competitive for the last decade. The first important change is the so-called hub-and-spoke route system. Now, by having a lot of flights coming in and out of the same city every day, in a very coordinated way, an airline could get major efficiencies in operations, in marketing, and a number of other aspects of the business. The effect of the hub-and-spoke system was that airlines have started to compete on the basis of hubs, not on every individual flight. And this has also raised the barriers to entry into the airline industry. To get into a city now, you have to offer enough flights to compete with that airline who has that city as a hub. Another force changing the airline industry is the emergence of sophisticated management information systems. An airline is involved in hundreds of millions of transactions every day, fares, schedules, tickets, and modern computer technology has revolutionized the way all this can be done. It's allowed it to be automated. The problem, though, is that it takes millions and if not hundreds of millions of dollars for an airline to develop this kind of sophisticated technology. And this huge investment has substantially raised the barriers to entry into this industry and given a new lever for some airlines to outdo others. The final change in the airline industry that's going to improve the industry structure is the so-called frequent traveler programs, where airlines give free travel to passengers who accumulate miles on their airline. Now, what, what are the airlines trying to do with frequent traveler programs? You'll remember that one of the crucial problems in the industry is that it was hard to differentiate. One airline was perceived as the same as another. Well, the frequent traveler programs have started to change that equation, and in the process, again, rivalry is starting to get less intense, and the barriers to entry are going up. Now, we've seen a number of industry examples spanning uh, very different types of industries. What should we have learned about industry analysis? Well, first of all, we should have learned that industry analysis is the starting point of any strategy. You simply must understand the structure of each and every industry in which you're competing and the underlying reasons why that structure is what it is. Each industry is going to be different in terms of which competitive force is the most significant. And sometimes it's the buyer, sometimes it's barriers to entry, sometimes it's rivalry. But whichever force is most significant, that's the place where strategic attention really needs to be placed. That's where you should focus your creative energies in trying to improve your environment. Another crucial lesson in industry analysis is that you must constantly be looking for how your industry might change because we've seen in airlines and pharmaceuticals how important and even revolutionary industry structural change might be. And we've seen how to use the five forces framework to analyze how your industry might indeed be changing. We've also seen, however, that companies have the power to shape their industry. You're not a passive uh, participant in your industry. You can influence how industry structure evolves. And an essential part of any company's strategy must be an approach to making the industry structure better, particularly if a company is a leading company. But the final lesson is that there's a flip side of all this, and that is that companies can unwittingly destroy their industry just as easily as they can make it better. Many companies, by not thinking through the implications of their strategic moves, will go down a strategic path that undermines the industry structure, that makes the five forces worse. Any strategic move of any sort must constantly be tested against its impact on the fundamental structure.
we've looked at how to analyze an industry, the first essential question in strategy. Now let's turn to the second question. How does a company achieve superior performance within its industry, whatever the average industry profitability may be? Now the starting point for understanding why a company is a superior performer is pretty simple. That is that to be a superior performer in your industry, you've got to have a sustainable competitive advantage. A company has to have something it can do better than its rivals that it can protect from imitation. It can keep its competitors from replicating. Now, advantage can be sustained in one of two ways. Either you can be lucky enough to come up with something that your competitors can't ever copy, which is rare, or more commonly, you can improve faster than your competitors can catch up. And continuous improvement and continuous search for new uh, benefits and edges is really part and parcel to most successful companies' ability to sustain advantage. Now, if competitive advantage is the key to superior performance, how do we get one? Well, to understand that question, we must recognize that there are two basic types of competitive advantage that any company can possess. One is low cost. The company can be lower cost in designing and producing and delivering and marketing its products than its competitors. It has lower cost and therefore it can earn superior margins and therefore superior performance. Now, the other kind of competitive advantage is what I like to call differentiation. A company that's differentiated is able to provide some kind of unique benefit that its customer thinks is important. And because it's unique in an important area, its customer is willing to pay at a premium price. And that premium price leads to superior margins and, in turn, superior performance. Now, if we think about it, almost any strength or any weakness that a company has can be translated either into something that makes their relative cost position high or low, or something that affects their ability to be differentiated relative to their competitors. And as we'll see later, it's very important to understand which one a company is trying to achieve. Now, in seeking one of these two types of competitive advantage, any company has another fundamental choice to make in setting its strategy. And that's what I like to call competitive scope. The breadth of the target within which it's seeking to gain that advantage. Now some companies, like General Motors historically in the automobile industry, have picked a broad competitive scope. They've, they've offered a wide range of products to a wide range of customers in a wide range of geographic markets. Other companies recognize that they can't achieve competitive advantage with a broad range of consumers or in a broad range of product lines. And therefore, they pick what I would call a narrow scope, uh, focusing on a particular product line, a particular type of customer, a particular type of geographic area, perhaps. And they seek to gain advantage in this narrow arena, even though they can't achieve it overall. Now, these two essential variables, the type of advantage and the scope of advantage lead to what I like to call generic strategies. Some fundamentally different routes to competitive advantage that companies can choose. Now, as you see in this chart, uh, there are four basic options. A company can seek a broad positioning and to be the low cost producer. Or it can seek a broad positioning and try to differentiate itself with that wide range of customers and segments and so on. Or it can choose a focus strategy by narrowing its target to some unusual segment and seeking to be either low cost or differentiated in that particular area, even though it can't achieve those advantages overall. What we learn from studying a wide range of industries is that the worst strategic error is to be stuck in the middle, to not be willing to choose which of these routes to competitive advantage the company is going to follow to worry about quality and differentiation, but not achieve uniqueness in anything, and to think about segmentation of the market, but to not be willing to dedicate themselves to a particular narrow segment. These kind of companies are stuck in the middle, and they're going to be the below average performers in any industry. Any company seeking to gain a cost advantage must start with a good product. 
a low-cost strategy starts with a good product. It starts with a product that's acceptable in quality, that's acceptable in features, that meets uh, the basic needs of the consumer. But the low-cost competitor doesn't offer all the frills and all the bells and all the whistles that they potentially could. They seek simply to produce a good basic product. Instead of frills, their advantage is going to come from opening up a significant and a sustainable cost gap over all their competitors. And they do this by managing the critical drivers of cost in their business, whatever they may be. Now, in gaining this low cost position, the cost leader translates this into superior margins provided they can command prices that are at or near the industry average. In strategy, there's a very important equation which determines uh, fundamentally a company's ability to be a superior performer. And that equation is the comparison of a company's prices relative to its competitors and its cost position relative to competitors. Any company that's a superior performer either has higher prices or lower costs, but there's a balance to be struck. In a cost leadership strategy, a company is trying to be the low cost producer and get a cost advantage. That's where its advantage is going to come from. But it must not let its prices get too low or its cost advantage will be nullified or offset by lower prices. Now, let's look at two companies that have successfully implemented cost-based strategies. Every one of us uses bar soap, hopefully every day. That's why it's a $1.6 billion industry in the United States. When one thinks of soap, one thinks of one company, Procter & Gamble. When one thinks of Procter & Gamble, one thinks of one soap, Ivory. One might think soap is a mundane business where there's little opportunity for strategy. After all, soap is soap. Uh, in fact, soap provides a fascinating example of competitive positioning. Ivory was introduced uh, many years ago, actually in 1879. Uh, at the time, there were over 300 companies in the soap industry. Uh, most of these companies competed with a strategy uh, producing very crude soaps. The other competitors in the soap industry at the time were producers of very expensive luxury soaps. Now, Ivory decided to enter the market with a very different strategy uh, for the time. The basic ivory strategy was to introduce a pure, mild bar of soap uh, without the harsh ingredients and alkalis that were characteristic of the other soaps of the time. The ivory bar also floated. Interestingly enough, though, the floating was an accident. Uh, ivory uh, made some bars up by accident in the manufacturing process, and it turned out that they floated. Consumers were so interested in that feature that uh, Procter & Gamble quickly uh, uh, decided that it was a good idea. In addition to the product itself, however, Ivory created some very important symbols of its strategy. The first was whiteness. At the time, most soaps were brown in color, various shades of brown. Ivory instead became uh, the white soap. Ivory was the first heavily advertised soap, in fact one of the first heavily advertised brands in the United States of any kind. In addition to the advertising though was the advertising message. Harley Proctor had a very interesting idea. He had the problem of communicating purity and there was no well-established standards for purity in the consumer's mind. So Harley Proctor designed his own measure of purity uh, which led to the famous slogan 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. Uh, this became the uh, slogan that personified the Ivory brand. Once Harley Proctor had created this uh, measure of purity, he aggressively used comparison ads with other soaps. In fact, tables appeared in magazines which uh, compared Ivory to other brands. Later on, he started very early to use endorsements. Uh, he had chemists and physicians uh, certified to the purity of the Ivory brand. The final early innovation in Procter & Gamble advertising was the use of the image of the baby. The baby became one of the early symbols of ivory. Uh, mild, if it's mild enough for the baby, it's got to be mild enough for you. The results of the ivory strategy were astounding. 
Ivory became the differentiated soap in the United States. It commanded a premium price. And it also commanded a leading share of the soap market, uh, uh, dominating all other competitors. Ivory pursued its differentiation strategy up through the 1940s and 1950s. But important changes in the industry in the 1950s and 1960s were threatening and challenging the traditional ivory strategy. The first was dial. Dial was the first of the so-called deodorant bars. In addition to basic cleaning, it offered a deodorizing feature as well. A number of other deodorant bars followed. The second major development was Dove. Dove was specially formulated to uh, take good care of the skin, so-called beauty bar. Dove was introduced in 1956, and again, others followed. Now, the introduction of Dial and Dove fundamentally threatened the positioning of Ivory as the differentiated soap. These new products had features that Ivory didn't have. Now, Procter & Gamble had a choice at this stage. It could have added these new features, one or both of them, to Ivory, but it chose not to. Instead, Procter & Gamble decided to strategically reposition Ivory. Now, the basic Ivory bar remained the same. It's white, it floats, it's 99, 44, 100 percent pure. But Ivory moved from being the differentiated soap to being the good basic soap that represents a good value. It moved from being the differentiator to being the cost leader in the soap industry. And in the process, Ivory was able to maintain its leading market position. Now, what is the new Ivory strategy? Well, let's start with the bar. The ivory strategy is to have a simple, basic, no-frills soap. No unnecessary ingredients, no scents, no perfumes. Now, how about the packaging? Well, as you can see here, the ivory package aims for simplicity. There's no expensive papers, no shiny paper, no garish colors. Uh, look at this, this bar here. Uh, that's pretty garish. Uh, ivory goes for simplicity, for simple, uh, for uh, uh, basic. Oh, bundling. Here's an example of a bundle of soap. There are six bars here sold together. And what this did was go from having a bunch of bars uh, sitting in the bin in a disarray to a, a neat kind of package. And the idea here was that ivory could be used by the whole family, so you should buy it in quantity. The user for ivory is a remarkably diverse consumer base. Um, there is no, uh, no meaningful demographic skew on ivory, as you might expect with a brand of that kind of market share and broad usage. It is, uh, it is well developed amongst females, adult males, uh, children and, and infants yeah. um, for many, many purposes, ranging from face to hands, bath, shower. And um, that is really one of the things that makes Ivory unique. When we sit down with consumers, we'll give them an array of you know, 30 or 40 uh, available brands and ask them to cluster them as, as they see the, the brands clustering. Uh, Ivory always sits out by itself. Mm -hmm. And, and that's one of the things that distinguishes it, is it's, it's really all-purpose uh, versatility. Ivory's pricing changed to reflect its fundamental shift in strategy. Instead of pricing at a premium, Ivory set its prices lower than its major differentiated competitors. The final aspect of Ivory's strategy was advertising. And Ivory advertising again stressed this theme of simplicity, a basic soap for the whole family, nothing more, nothing less. I know, I knew, but this price can't be right. What's wrong? Ivory costs less than just about all the other soaps in the store. It usually does. I can't believe a great soap like Ivory costs less. I mean, that rich lather and natural kind of clean. In fact, four bars of Ivory usually cost less than three of most others. I thought they'd charge more for a great soap like Ivory. They probably should. <laughs> You'd expect to pay more for Ivory, but isn't it nice you don't have to? We've seen the new Ivory strategy. Now, what makes Ivory low cost? Well, let's look at a number of the most important elements. Let's start with the air bubbles. The air bubbles in the Ivory product inherently reduce the amount of material 
required to manufacture an ivory bar. The lack of expensive additives like deodorants or beauty features also make the bar inherently less expensive. The simple packaging with no shiny uh, materials or expensive papers are inherently cheaper to produce. And ivory, because of its long, consistent brand image, controls advertising cost. Now, the brand image, in addition to the fact that ivory is such a good value because of its lower price, means that ivory is a very effective traffic builder for the retail store. And that means that ivory uh, has to spend less on trade promotion than many of its competitors do. When you add to this that, that Procter & Gamble gets other cost advantages through scale and things like purchasing and distribution, all this means that ivory has a substantial cost advantage over many of its competitors. Ivory charges a lower price, but its cost, because of this strategy, is even lower. And the result is a very profitable business. The intriguing thing about the ivory strategy is it makes many of these cost savings into a virtue. Now, if we step back from the soap competition that I've described, I think we can get some insight into how various strategies play against each other in the industry. Now, we can see from the diagram that ivory competes with just about everybody. It competes with Dial and Dove for the more quality sensitive consumers. It competes with the no-name brands for the very price sensitive consumer. It doesn't compete, however, very much with the exotic brands because they're really targeting a totally different part of the market. But despite Ivory's success, the soap business isn't standing still. It's always changing. The latest interesting development in the industry is this product here. It's a new soap called Pure and Natural. Does that remind you a little bit of Ivory? In most companies, old brands sort of get left alone to kind of fade away. But that hasn't happened at Ivory. Why not? Why the continual improvement? Well, Ivory really became a gigantic brand to us very quickly. It was really part of Americana before the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It was the leading brand, and it wasn't very difficult in those circumstances to realize the importance of keeping it up to date in terms of what consumers wanted and also to recognize the very particular characteristics it had of mm -hmm. purity and mildness, floated, was white. So the fact that um, it was of such gigantic importance to the company, there were many people in those days that called Procter & Gamble the ivory company. Huh. So the whole idea of maturity is sort of a misnomer, isn't it? Totally misnomer. The idea that there is some product life cycle, which you'll sometimes hear talked about, that you're destined somehow to go up and then start to come down, is totally a, 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 an issue that's in the control of the people managing the business. You mentioned earlier that it's the sort of key first step is really being in touch with the consumer and what that consumer really wants at a very personal level. You know, how do you and the other Procter & Gamble executives actually do that? How do, you, how, do you, how do you understand the consumer? You just can't kind of think about it. You've got to get more input than that. How do you do it? You've got to sit down and talk to consumers. Um, and there are a whole variety, and you need to do it in a whole variety of ways. Uh, uh, you can get benefit from talking to a group of consumers um, at one place. And, uh, and I do that every time we've introduced a major new brand. Since I've been president of this company, and I certainly did it before, I will find an opportunity to get out into the test market. And I want to look at stores, but I also want to sit down in a room with consumers and hear them talk about the brand. We've talked a lot about the change at Ivory. But you've already hinted at the continuity. Despite uh, over 100 years of history, here's a brand where certain essential elements have been preserved. How do you actually preserve continuity as people change, as time changes? What process do you use to do that? Well, there's several, as you'd expect. Um, one, uh, one, one is simply uh, the continuity of our own uh, management. Uh, we promote from within without really any exception. Uh, we know each other awfully well. The uh, people who've been responsible for Ivory over the last 
oh, 30, 35 years are all still in this company. Now, they're not all on working on ivory every day or every week or even every year, but they are here. The point of continuity, too, I would also uh, stress is importantly related to our advertising agencies and our attitude toward our advertising agencies. Our relationships uh, with agencies are ones that are very long-lasting for us. And uh, again, Ivory is a marvelous example of that. We have, we have been working with the same agency on Ivory for 67 years. John, what does a brand mean at Procter & Gamble? Well, we think of a brand as, it's almost a lie. That may sound corny to say that, but it, it becomes almost a person. Uh, begins, uh, it's first and foremost something that we just see bring benefits to, to consumers, and that's the way we really view what we're about, is bringing benefits to the consumers. Yeah, but it, it, it assumes a personality, almost a character to it. Now, as we look over the history of, of the bar soap category and the history of ivory, we see a succession of new segments opening up and new competitors coming on the scene, uh, Dial, uh, Dove, other, other products. Now, by and large, Procter & Gamble, in dealing with those changes, has chosen not to kind of change ivory, but rather to introduce new brands. Why is that? Why not just create a, a new model of ivory? Why, why introduce a whole new brand? These have been very difficult, challenging decisions. Each one of those you mentioned. Should we make ivory a deodorant bar? Should we add cold cream or some other cosmetic ingredient to ivory? Mm -hmm. Believe me, uh, as I answer this, don't let me leave you with the impression that the answer was obvious or we didn't go back and forth in the thinking process on it. We did, and on each and every one of them. Um, but in each one of them, too, we felt that the right way to proceed was to introduce a different brand to provide that benefit because we felt that adding deodorants to ivory or adding a cold cream ingredient to ivory would really be inconsistent with um, one of the basic features, qualities, attributes that consumers wanted. And because we felt that the values that ivory did stand for uh, as it was, were still of such broad appeal and broad interest to consumers that uh, we would be able to have a healthy and if we operated it properly, a growing business without having those ingredients. So we felt we ought to leave ivory in that sense the way it was, that is not containing these ingredients and not providing those particular benefits and do them on another brand. Now, we've seen and heard the ivory story, a, a classic story in American industry. What lessons does the ivory story hold for strategy? Well, I think it holds lessons at two different levels. For strategy in general, as well as how to compete with a low-cost strategy. The soap industry illustrates how a number of companies can successfully compete in the same industry, provided they choose different strategies. Ivory has been successful, Dial has been successful, Dove has been successful. They're all choosing different positions in the marketplace. But Me Too strategies rarely succeed. We've never heard of most of the other soap brands that tried to imitate either Ivory or Dial and Dove. They never made it. The Ivory case also shows us that the successful strategies are ones that are consistently implemented over long periods of time. You can't succeed in strategy if you're flip-flopping what you're trying to be every year. The flip-flopping not only confuses your organization, but it confuses the marketplace. The marketplace doesn't really know what to make of your product or service. Now, the ivory story, however, vividly illustrates the principle that strategy has to change if the industry structure or competitive positions uh, change enough. The emergence of new buyer needs the threat of new competitors may force a company, as it did Ivory, to shift its strategy. In Ivory's case, from differentiation to low cost. But shifting a strategy is a very risky and very time-consuming process. And Ivory shows how long it took, really, to fundamentally reposition the company. Now, 
We've seen a company that's drawn its cost advantage from a broadly targeted strategy. Let's look at another company that succeeded in creating a cost advantage through focus. Boy, I sure am glad I didn't have to drive here from Boston. It had taken me about 40 hours because I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and I've just driven up to a place called La Quinta. That means country house in Spanish. La Quinta is one of the most successful motel chains in the United States. Founded in 1968, today it has about 200 locations spread all over the southwestern part of the United States and, and, and outlying areas. La Quinta's results uh, during the 70s and into the 80s were truly spectacular, second to none. In recent years, uh, however, La Quinta's profits have been modest. Uh, it's been hit by the Texas energy recession, by problems in the agricultural sector, uh, and by a dramatic overbuilding of motel rooms in this region. But short-term profitability is not a good measure of the strategic health of a company. And La Quinta provides an excellent example. From a strategic point of view, La Quinta could not be in a stronger position. Their customers are satisfied, their competitors uh, can't match them, and Consumer Reports recently evaluated them as the leading uh, lodging chain in their category. Now, to understand La Quinta's strategy, I think the best place to start is just to go take a look. Now, what's going on here? What's going on is that most lodging companies cater to a wide range of travelers with a wide range of needs. They have families, they have high rollers, they have chief executives, they have uh, people uh, traveling for personal reasons, and they provide those travelers a wide range of services to meet their equally wide range of needs. Uh, daycare for the family, a fancy suite for the high roller, uh, a room service for the tired executive who doesn't know where else to go to dinner and doesn't want to be uh, go out alone. Instead of trying to serve a wide range of travelers and meet their equally wide range of needs, La Quinta has chosen to focus on a particular kind of traveler, a particular target customer, and dedicate themselves to meeting this particular customer's somewhat unusual needs. A classic focus strategy. Now, La Quinta's target customer is a commercial man or commercial person, a sales representative, a service representative, an auditor, somebody who travels frequently, who travels repetitively over and over again to the same places. The average La Quinta customer spends 17 nights a year in a La Quinta. La Quinta seeks to meet the needs of this somewhat peculiar customer very, very well and no more. And as we'll see, Everything in a La Quinta and throughout the La Quinta organization is consistent with this objective. La Quinta's strategy starts with location, location, location. As Sam Barshop, La Quinta's founder, told me recently, uh, you can change just about anything about a motor in except where it is. Every La Quinta is located right next to a major highway, often an interstate highway. It has good access and excellent visibility. The La Quinta is near an industrial park, an airport, a medical complex, somewhere where business people go a lot. Now, over here you'll see a restaurant right across the way from the La Quinta. The restaurant is open 24 hours a day. In fact, every single La Quinta is built next door to a 24-hour restaurant. Many of them are Denny's. Now, the fact that there's a restaurant right there means that La Quinta doesn't need a restaurant of its own at all. If its guest wants to go to breakfast, he just walks across the street. La Quinta wants no part of the restaurant business for a number of reasons. The first is that Sam Barshop lost his shirt in the restaurant business when he was growing up. Uh, more importantly, though, the restaurant business is a different business than running a motel, and it's a business that most lodging establishments lose money on and have to subsidize with higher room rates. Now, my room here is about 300 square feet in size. That's as big or even bigger than a Marriott or a Hilton or a Sheraton room would be. And to top it off, La Quinta's rooms are all built with an all-concrete construction technique. 
And this construction technique combined with a lot of soundproofing between the various rooms means that it's quiet. It's beautifully quiet. And you can actually get a good night's sleep. Now when you combine all this with 24-hour message service and in a heavy dose of good uh, down-home personal attention, what you get for a La Quinta's customer is truly an irresistible deal. And it's an irresistible deal that cost only $40, substantially less than a comparable room would cost at a competitor. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Bailey. Will you be checking out this yes, morning? Yes, I will be. Thank room 107? That's correct. Thank uh -huh. you. Excuse me, can I ask you a few questions? Sure. Uh, what do you do? I'm a salesman. I travel the state of Texas, uh, selling newspaper vending machines of all things. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. how, have you been here before? Oh, yes. Yeah, I stay here every time I'm in San Antonio. And how often is that? Well, I get through here about every four weeks. Mm -hmm. About every four mm -hmm. weeks. Why do you stay here? Well, I think probably the most, main reason I stay at the Quinta is consistency. Uh -huh. uh, every motel is like the other one, and uh, all the rooms are comfortable. I know what I'm going to get in advance. Now, they don't have room service here. Does that bother you? No, not at all. Not well, at all. Why not? Well, I, I don't really require that. I, uh, uh, traveling, I'm out to lunch with people during the day. Sometimes I have uh, evening appointments that I make, and uh, I'm busy. So uh -huh. throughout the day, I uh, keep myself moving, and uh, to be catered to in a motel, I don't require that. I just want a good place to sleep and rest and do my reports to get on the next day. And La Quinta is that place? Oh, absolutely. Now, the question is, how is La Quinta able to deliver all this at such a low cost? Now, the first reason should already be apparent from what we've seen so far. La Quinta avoids unnecessary services from the perspective of their target customer. They also uh, avoid wasted space. There's no restaurants, there's no room service, there's no atrium. This means that the operating cost per room at La Quinta is held down. It also means that the amount of investment required per room at La Quinta is also low. Despite the fact, therefore, that the room itself is as big or bigger than the competition, La Quinta's costs are lower. Now, another reason why La Quinta's costs are controlled is that there's a corporate fetish here uh, for cost control. Uh, corporate overhead is held down, uh, construction costs are managed carefully, purchasing costs are managed carefully. The corporate headquarters itself is sort of an interesting symbol of this. It's nice, but it's modest. There's no oak paneling, there's no frills uh, uh, that, that eat money. Now, in addition to these things, however, perhaps the secret weapon in La Quinta strategy is a couple of all things. Unlike most other lodging chains, a La Quinta is managed by a husband and wife team. They run the desk, they supervise virtually every aspect of what goes on here. And they actually live here. They live in an apartment, a nice apartment, provided on the premises along with some other perks. Now, the fact that La Quinta is managed by a couple holds down overall management costs. The couples are also very loyal to the company. They stay at La Quinta five years, seven years, ten years, reducing expensive turnover. And a final bonus, and perhaps the most important bonus of all, is that the couple and the other employees that they manage almost like a family at La Quinta provide warm, friendly service and a great deal of personal attention. So you can better understand La Quinta couples like receive extensive training before they ever take over a motor in. About 12 and a half weeks of training in all. Right now I'm in something they call the maintenance training lab and spread around this room are all the things that go wrong in a motor in. Roofs, air conditioners, TV sets, uh, faucets, uh, plumbing, lamps. And in this room the La Quinta couple uh, learns how to make basic simple repairs on the spot. Now this does a number of things. First of all, it makes the repairs happen quickly. You don't have to wait for somebody to show up. But very importantly, it reduces cost. And it's this kind of clever thinking, along with the design of the rooms, along with the sturdy construction, along with a lack of unnecessary services, that makes La Quinta such a low-cost provider of motel services.
Let's take, for example, having a bar uh, at La Quinta. You know, uh, at the end of a long day, a, a salesman comes back and wants to have a drink. Why isn't there a bar at La Quinta? You'd think that... It's not a bar because it's extra services. My, my, my theory has been, and it, it, it's stronger every day, is that the more services you give a customer, the more chances you have to make a mistake. If they want a drink, they'll take a bottle to the room or they'll go to a, a restaurant near the property and have a drink. But yeah. uh, we don't. We have found that is not way down the list as far as as priorities as far as our customer goes. But I guess it's fair to say that that when you build a strategy around this customer, uh, you're deliberately making a choice that there are some other customers with some other needs that might not be satisfied, and you're just making the choice. I think, and I think in in our, in our industry, and I think in all industry, you really have to target in on your customer, understand your customer, and listen to your customer, and work with your customer, and, and, and pay attention to every, uh, their needs. And their needs change. They change yearly. Mm -hmm. uh, we put in colored television, then we had to put in cable, then we had to give free coffee, the free telephones, there are things that they demand. And we, we constantly survey our customers and see what they want, because they're the boss. I'm not the boss of this company. It's every customer that walks through that door. Let's just pick a company like Marriott. Marriott has got its core product, its, its large properties that are located all around the country, but it's got this Marriott Courtyard concept. Now, what's Marriott trying to do? Are they trying to kind of come after the La Quinta segment? Is that what's going on? Marriott is trying to be the General Motors of the industry, and they're, and they're going to be. The difference between Marriott and La Quinta is Marriott thinks big, La Quinta thinks small. How about, uh, how would you compare La Quinta to, say, uh, uh, Motel 6, the classic Motel kind of low 6, price? Motel 6 knows what they are, and they, they're, they're another good company. They know what they are. Uh, they're selling room for about $20 a day. They are not competing for our customers. They're taking people off the backs of motorcycles and, and campers and putting them into a motel room. La Quinta has always had a, a, a very great sensitivity to cost. Uh, partly to keep the price of that room down, because that's as essential to the strategy. How do you keep the attention to cost in the company? I say, I talk about nickels and dimes and one the company, we're not working on dollars in this company, we're working on nickels and dimes, we're working on minutes in cleaning the room. And we're working on uh, every, every dollar we can save in building a building we can make because our buildings are, are so cost-effective now. We know every nail, we know every brick that goes in that building. We know what the land cost should be. Uh, we, we understand the product and that's, see that's a big advantage of having only one product. We know it well from bottom to top. When I hear you talk it seems almost to me like you're managing a private company but you're public. How do you do that? You know they hear a lot of talk about Wall Street putting short-term earnings pressure on companies, but yet you continue to spend on renovations in the teeth of the Texas recession and 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 all those kind of things. How can you get away with it? Well, look, it's very simple. All you have to look around you at, at American industry and see what's happened to the people that have had short-term perspectives. It, I mean, you can't run a company short-term. And if you let Wall Street run your business, you're not going to be in business too long, I don't think. What are the lessons we can learn from La Quinta's strategy? Well, La Quinta is our first opportunity to look at a focuser. And there are some important principles in the La Quinta story for competing with a focus strategy. La Quinta also will allow us to broaden our understanding of what it takes to be successful in competing on cost. Now, La Quinta illustrates that a focus strategy starts with the bedrock of choosing a particular target segment, whether it be a particular target customer, a particular item in the product line, a particular geographic region. But this target segment has to have unusual or distinctive needs. If they're not unusual, the focuser won't gain any advantage over the broadly targeted competitor who will serve the segment perfectly well uh, as part of their broader strategy. Now, a focuser dedicates everything they do to serving the target segment exclusively and not worrying about anybody else. We see in La Quinta's strategy how every step of their product and service offering related to that uh, traveling salesperson. 
and how that, that tied together everything La Quinta did. La Quinta case also shows that any focuser is always under constant, relentless pressure to broaden or fuzz their strategy. There's always the temptation to add an extra service or add an extra product in order to get a few more customers. But this temptation simply must be resisted because if a company starts to fuzz the edge of its focus strategy, it will lose the essential competitive advantage on which it's based, which is this dedication, this consistency of everything they do to that particular target. Now, what can we learn from La Quinta about competing on cost? Well, we learned that a cost-focused strategy depends on finding a target segment that has somewhat lower needs for services or features than most of the market. In La Quinta's case, their customer didn't want a lot of services and features that most motels offered. And La Quinta was able to be low cost simply by finding this customer with that lower level of need. La Quinta shows how cost advantage requires investment. La Quinta spent aggressively on management information systems to reduce the bookkeeping requirements in the locations. They used all concrete construction, which lowered the maintenance cost, but it was expensive. They also uh, aggressively renovated their properties to keep the level of the quality of the product up. A final very important lesson from La Quinta's strategy is how uh, cost leadership requires that cost become really part of the culture of the company. It becomes something that everybody in the company is worrying about every day. And we certainly saw this at La Quinta. Now, we've seen two companies competing with cost-based strategies, one with a broad target and the other choosing the strategy of cost focus. To get some additional perspective on competing on cost, let's go to Emerson Electric Company and talk to Chuck Knight, Emerson's CEO. Emerson is probably the company in the United States that's most identified with being a successful low-cost competitor. Chuck, Emerson uses the term best cost producer to describe its approach to a cost leadership strategy. What steps does Emerson take to be the best cost producer? Mike, that's, a, I guess, a long story because it evolved out of first uh, being the, the, the low cost producer, which was kind of a, a theme we had across the corporation in the 70s. But as we uh, started to get into the whole concepts of world class manufacturing, uh, we knew just being the lowest cost producer wasn't the answer. And, and so we moved to a definition of best cost producer, which involved six key points for us that we used as communication techniques across the corporation to define what we were trying to do. And the first was uh, quality. We couldn't be the best cost producer without having the best quality. They were synonymous. And uh, secondly was to know the competitor's cost. Uh, I, people just really can't know where they are if they don't take the time and energy to find out what their competition's costs are. Third was the, the need to have a receptivity to change and, 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 and the willingness to go after productivity in your plants and uh, the, the responsibility of management to, to set that tone and environment. Uh, fourth is uh, a formalized uh, cost reduction program uh, which is part of the planning process. and. Uh, too many times companies uh, do their cost reduction when times get tough and, and not on a continuous basis as a part of a desire to maintain or achieve a certain level of profitability. So formalized cost reductions. Strong communications related to those cost reductions because uh, we like to think as a part of our best cost producer plan that all of our employees are are part of it. They feel ownership and uh, the enemy isn't management, it's, it's, it's truly the competition. So. Uh, that's five, and, and the six is the commitment of capital to, uh, to make it happen. Why is quality so important? Well, to being low cost, it, because it's sort of a paradox. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, we, when we were in the low cost producer strategy, everybody used to say, it's all you guys do is cheapen your product. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll take material out, or you'll do this, or you'll do that. And, and really, the, the, the thing we're selling is the ultimate function and, and, and what our product does. And, and we found, and, and I've got to say, we learned this from our competition in the 70s and the early 80s, that, that 
they have the highest quality, ultimately, all the way through the loop. I'm talking not just quality in the plant, but quality in all the systems and the customer support and, and everything that goes on in the company to measure all that cost of quality across the board, that if you had the best quality, you also had the lowest cost. So that quality and cost aren't inconsistent. In fact, they're kind of complementary in many ways. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You mentioned knowing your competitor's cost. Uh, most companies don't tell you their cost. How do you go about at Emerson really understanding your competitor's cost? We show every one of our competitor's products to our people and where they're better than we are or what we're trying to do to make sure we have an edge and what the individual employee's involvement is in that process. Mm -hmm. And that's really the exciting part of it because once you really understand your competitor's product and its cost, you can then communicate more clearly to your employees why we have to do certain things. The people start to understand when they can touch and feel and and, and really see what, what, they're, what, what the battle is all about. If it's the competitors' costs that are forcing us to do this, not our crazy, dumb management who's trying to beat us up, that changes the tone, doesn't it? It really does. And, and, and not, people like to win. I mean, it's inherent in all of us. Yeah. We want to win. And yeah. so once they see what the target is and who the enemy is, yeah. it, it's a lot easier to focus all those resources and energies and, and a lot of fun, too. Yeah, it sure is. One of the things you mentioned, Chuck, was Emerson's formalized cost reduction program. Could you describe that? Yeah, I, I it's kind of nuts and bolts, but it might be of interest to, to you. I can, very uh, much so. What, we've been doing this a long time. And, and uh, what happens is in our planning conferences, we will, through the process of trying to understand the business, the competition, and the rest of it, get at a level of profitability that we are going to target. Mm -hmm. And out of that evolves a cost reduction target. And this goes on in 50, 60 different companies. Mm -hmm. And that particular company will, and every year this goes on as we go through our financial reviews, we set in motion how much cost reduction do we have to get. Mm -hmm. And in each plant is a man who has a re or a woman who has a responsibility for cost reduction. And then a quarterly system of follow-up. Mm -hmm. Uh, monthly in the divisions, but at corporate, we quarterly review the, the cost reduction progress and are we on target or aren't we on target and where are we missing and where are we not yeah. making it. And of course, that includes productivity as, as well as any other kind of cost reduction. Yeah. And that's tied directly back to our, our capital spending, yeah, of course. Sure. I think I, I recall seeing a, a list of cost reduction projects in a, di in a division or plant. Tell me about some of the projects. Give uh, there, us a feeling for I those. guess there's, there's probably uh, uh, not one project that if we, or maybe uh, 10 or 50, if we, if we didn't do them, it wouldn't matter. I mean, that's the beauty of it. And I like to say that you could go into any Emerson plant, any Emerson plant, and walk up to one of the people on the machine and ask them what cost reduction they're working on, and they'll describe it to you. Mm. And how many projects would a typical plant have? Hundreds. 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 Now, this notion of being a best cost producer is something that I think if I turn to just any random Emerson rep annual report, I'll find it written in here. Not only will I find it, but I'll find the steps laid out. So what you're doing is not a secret to your competition. Why can't they match you and one-up you? Because of the, 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 the subtle point you made earlier, this is not something that you put in a box and you know, bring out when you need it. It's a part of a management process that is tied back to what we're trying to accomplish as an objective for the company. We've had, I think, half of Fortune's 100 come down and talk to us over, let's say, the last five years about cost reduction. But if your management process isn't set up in all the subtle ways to incorporate that and make it work, it won't work for you. I think my discussion with Chuck Knight is a very fitting way to conclude our discussion of cost strategies. It illustrates, again, a number of vital points about this route to competitive advantage. First, cost leadership starts with a good product. There's nothing cheap or, or inadequate about a low-cost producer's product or service. 
it's good, but a cost leader is willing to make some choices in order to uh, be low cost, to give away some frills and features. We've also seen over and over how successful cost leaders draw their cost advantage from many sources throughout the business, wherever they can find it. It's not just in manufacturing. It's not just in design. As Chuck Knight has particularly emphasized, successful cost leaders pay intense and regular attention to their competitors' cost positions. They do the homework, the hard work necessary to understand their competitors' cost and use that as a focal point for understanding where they stand. All cost is relative. And competitors are a wonderful motivating device to drive an organization towards ever lower cost. We've also seen, and Chuck has emphasized, how successful cost leaders have cost literally built into the culture of their organization. Everybody is worrying about cost basically all the time. Now, many companies have the misconception that they can successfully compete on cost by having kind of episodes of cost reduction. Everybody worries about cost for three months, uh, chops out some people, and breathes a sigh of relief. The Emerson case, as well as the others we've looked at, shows how cost leaders constantly manage costs down. They constantly have a program to drive costs further and further. This is what it takes to be a successful cost leader. Many managers have a misconception about cost strategies. Somehow they view cost strategies as cheap or low wage or somehow dishonorable. I've gotten the sense in many companies that real managers don't compete on costs. That's somehow a sign of failure. I hope those uh, misconceptions have been vividly overcome by what you've just seen. Cost is one important and viable route to competitive advantage, and many of you uh, probably ought to choose it.